Good morning, and welcome once again to First Parish Church in beautiful Manchester by the Sea on this June Sunday morning, a day when we gather together in worship and celebration of God's presence and power and goodness and challenge and call for our lives, and a day when we also remember and we celebrate and we give thanks for fathers and grandfathers and all those men who have served as father figures for us during our lives. I welcome you here once again to this spiritual community where no matter who you are or where you are on your life or faith journey, you are fully welcome. And in that vein, I now welcome you to join in the singing of our opening hymn, Rejoice You Pure in Heart, the lyrics to which are printed in your online bulletin. I invite you to now join me in our opening prayer, the words to which are also printed in your online bulletin. Holy, Holy One, one we, come we come together, together this, this day, day with gratitude, gratitude wonder, wonder, and hope. hope. We, are we are grateful for the, for the many ways you bless us. us. We, we wonder, wonder how you will speak to us and move us today, today and beyond. beyond. We, we hope, hope in your, your promise, promise of new and better, better life. life 
for those those who who walk walk with you and your your ways. As we have opened ourselves up to this this sacred sacred time, time, may you also open our minds, hearts, hands, and spirits to the possibilities you call us to for the sake of others, this nation, and the world. The possibilities for helping you move all things closer to becoming all you created them for. During this time, then, May we we listen listen carefully, carefully, think think broadly, broadly, feel feel deeply, deeply, pray pray sincerely, sincerely, and and sing sing joyfully. And may may we do all this in the name of the one you sent to show us and teach us your essence and ways, our brother, teacher, and leader, Jesus, the one who gave us the words we pray to you now, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
as we enter into our time of prayer this morning. I'd like you to keep in your thoughts and prayers uh, one great joy today. Today is Larry Kirby's 96th birthday. Larry, a longtime member and filler of this spiritual community. Larry is 96 today. Uh, we also, again, ask you to hold in your thoughts and prayers and give your thanks and appreciation to all fathers and grandfathers and men who have served as father figures to any and all of God's children. We once again ask you to hold in your thoughts and prayers Diane Houghton as she continues her rehabilitation from her broken humerus. And of course, we once again ask you to hold in your thoughts and prayers all those, all those who are serving as caretakers uh, medically in hospitals and nursing homes, wherever they are, those who are tending to those who have suffered and continue to suffer from the effects of the coronavirus. With all of those, I now invite you to add any joys or concerns, any prayer intentions that you wish. Share them with either the people who you are watching this with or simply keep them in the silence of your hearts and minds and whatever the case may be, let us now offer all of those to our God. Let us pray. Holy One, we thank you for the example of Jesus' life, a life rooted in justice, mercy, compassion, and forgiveness, a life that cared for all humanity, especially those who were least powerful and most marginalized, those stranded in pits of despair or poverty. Be with all who are feeling the bitter winds of illness, struggle, and scarcity. Strengthen them with the breath of your love and grace. Keep us from apathy toward those who are suffering, O oh Lord, or those who have been overtaken by the challenges of life. Give us a wider perspective on our lives and this world. Give us hearts of compassion and kindness, especially for those who feel alone, unloved, uncared for, forgotten. May your love and grace flow through us to all those who are in need. And may we put you and your ways first in our lives our families, our households, our nation, and this world. Amen.
going to share these words from the 10th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear those who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have come to bring peace, not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. So how's the language been in your household the last few weeks? That's the question that the writer and editor, Ruman Alam, asked a number of people that he knows not too long ago. And he asked them that question because as he wrote in a piece recently, over the time of the pandemic, as the time of the pandemic had gone on and on, gone on longer, the longer that the schools had been closed and activities either remained canceled or restricted, Alam had noticed that as that time had gone on, his sons had started to swear more in his hearing around the house, other than the rare slip of the tongue. So Alam asked a number of his friends about that asked him if they'd noticed anything like that in their home. And as he puts it, he was somewhat relieved, somewhat relieved, to learn that it wasn't just his kids. And it wasn't just kids. As a number of Alam's friends told him, as the time of the pandemic has gone on, as the quarantining has gone on as the activities have continued to be canceled or restricted. They too had found themselves swearing a bit more than usual in their homes. And as a number of them also pointed out to Alam, that was probably why their kids were too. That they were simply repeating what they had heard following their parents' example. And I don't know about you, but I know that feeling all too well. See, there's a number of years between our son and our daughter. And quite a few years ago, when our daughter was little, I took her to one of our son's soccer matches. It was November, it was at night, it was cold, so we were going to watch the match from the car. I was in the front, she was in the back. At one point during the match, our son did or didn't do something, I can't remember which it was, that you know, I thought he could have done a little bit better at, so I muttered something in the front seat, or at least I 
thought I had muttered it to myself when about five seconds later, uh, I heard the very same thing coming from the back seat. <laughs> Not exactly my parent Hall of Fame moment. But I had done it, I had muttered that swear word out of a little bit of frustration, the frustration that parents feel when their kids don't do something that the parent feels that they're fully capable of doing. Not, not excusing it, not justifying it in any way, just explaining it. And what Alam says is it is frustration that is at the heart of this increase in swearing that he and his friends have experienced over the course of this pandemic. Just a different kind of frustration. It's been a hundred days. Someone reminded me this week that it's, been, it's now been a hundred days since the schools had closed and activities either canceled or greatly restricted here in Manchester by the sea and also, I, I believe, in a number of places throughout the country. A hundred days. Kids are frustrated, and understandably so. Parents and other adults are frustrated, and understandably so. As Alam writes, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated by continuing to have to pretend that I'm qualified to be my son's teacher. I'm frustrated by still having to be their primary in-person social experience. I'm frustrated by trying to continue to manage my personal and professional obligations. Frustration, and understandable frustration. So Alam's conclusion, it's not ideal, it's not ideal, but don't go to war over the swearing. In the big scheme of things, don't go to war over the swearing. Don't let it be something that comes between you and the members of your household. Besides, that's what Jesus is for. I mean, Alam doesn't say that last part, but Jesus sure seems to. These verses that we just shared from the 10th chapter of Matthew's Gospel are part of what scholars refer to as that Gospel's commissioning speech. In that chapter, Jesus gives his closest followers some instructions and uh, some advice and some caution before sending them out into the world to spread his message, to continue his work. And as part of that, he tells them, he warns them, that there are those out there who will be so opposed to that message, to the message of God and God's ways as Jesus embodied them, to that message of the equality of all people in God's eyes, to the message of God requiring equal justice for all people, to the message of caring for the least in society, the widows and orphans, to the message of nonviolence. There will be people so opposed to that message that they will harm, even kill, to stop it. Now again, this is one of the places in the gospel, where the message is for both the disciples in Jesus' time, but even more specifically, for the early Christian community that Matthew's gospel came out of several decades after Jesus' death. A community that was facing the very real possibility and likelihood of physical persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire. And Jesus tells them, 
do not be afraid. Despite that, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, the Roman Empire, but not the soul. The soul here in the Gospels, meaning our essence, our true self, our real self, as rooted in the divine spark that God has placed in each of us. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but can't kill that. And they can't kill that if you stay faithful to God's ways. Only God can kill the soul. And Jesus doesn't mean by that God as the literal instrument of our soul's death. What Jesus means by that is that the soul dies. It dies when we turn away from God and God's ways, when we do not root our lives in God and God's ways of love and compassion and mercy and kindness and justice and forgiveness. That's what kills the soul. However, to be fair, after all that talk about the body being killed, we would understand it if some of Jesus' disciples started to think, I wonder if he'd notice if I just slowly backed away and headed for home. We get that. <clears throat> Except that apparently home's not much safer. Because Jesus goes on to say that don't think that I've come to bring peace to the world. I haven't come to bring peace. I have come to bring a sword. And then he goes on. I have come to set son against father. Happy Father's Day. I've come to set son against father. But Jesus is not a sexist because then he continues. I've also come to set daughter against mother and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And then for good measure, whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, <clears throat> first off, he's not talking about a literal sword. I've come to bring a sword. I mean, what happened to Prince of Peace, peace be with you, all that nice stuff? not talking about a literal sword. He's not advocating or calling for violence. What Jesus is doing there is he is appropriating the symbol, the instrument as, of peace as Rome understands it and turning it on its head. See, Rome understood peace as the elimination of conflict through physical force and domination through the sword. But Jesus says the peace of God is the opposite. The peace of God is the rightful resolution of conflict that is rooted in injustice and inequality and powerlessness. But even though there's no violence involved, that kind of peace, the call to work for that kind of peace can still cut. That's the other translation of the word sword, cutting. It can still cut. It can still be a source of conflict, even with those closest to us, even in our own household. Jesus isn't anti-family. It might sound like it, but he's not anti-family. He was a devout Jew. As a devout Jew, he fully understood the importance of family obligations. Remember, in John's Gospel, almost the last thing that Jesus does from the cross is make sure that his widowed mother is taken care of. He entrusts her into the care of that character we know as the disciple Jesus loved. Jesus is not anti-family, but what Jesus does do 
is call us to expand on, to consider more thoughtfully our understanding of family in two particular ways. The first, throughout the gospel, Jesus calls on us to enlarge our understanding of family. That family isn't just about biology or those who we share the same household with. What Jesus tries to get us to understand is that all people are equally loved and valued by God as God's sons and daughters, and therefore they are to be our equally loved and valued brothers and sisters. All people. But then the other way that Jesus challenges us to think carefully about our understanding of family is more specific to this passage. More specific to this passage. It is a caution. A caution against turning family into an idol into an object of worship. More specifically, an object of worship that we worship before we worship God. What Jesus is talking about here is a caution to us about making family our be-all and end-all, putting it first in our lives instead of putting God and God's ways first in our lives. And that matters. That is a vital spiritual idea because when we think about it, we know the harm that can be done when we idolize family before we prioritize God and God's ways in our lives and in our homes. We know the harm that is done. The ignoring or the refusal to report child abuse because, well, that kind of thing needs to stay in the family. Undue pressure put on kids, or the falsification of academic or athletic records, or bribery in order to get kids into the best schools, because, well, family first. The treating of those with addictions or mental health issues, as outcast, outcast from our own families because, well, it doesn't reflect well on the family. We know the harm that can be done by turning family into idols. Jesus is not anti-family. He's pro-God. He's pro-God's priorities. He is pro our prioritizing God's priorities in our homes, in our households. See, there's a a vital spiritual paradox in the Christian tradition. If we really, if we truly want to put family first, we need to put it second. If we really want family to be first in our lives, we need to put it second, second to God and God's ways, second to God and God's call for our lives, second to God's priorities for all of us. If we want to have our families understand peace, we need to do that. We need to prioritize peace as God understands it. If we want to truly love our families to the fullest, we need to love as God loves, unconditionally. Family first by putting it second. By doing the things that God calls us to do, love our neighbor as ourselves care for widows and orphans, the least in society. 
give a cup of cold water, as Jesus says at the end of this passage, give a cup of cold water to the little ones in the world. And lots of swearing. Lots and lots of swearing. Just not the kind that Alam's talking about, and certainly not the kind that I muttered from the front seat of the car that night. But swearing the way Jesus talks about it, the way Jesus refers to it, the only time and only way Jesus refers to swearing, also in Matthew's Gospel. Swearing as in oath-taking, promise-making. Swearing as in promising to put God and God's ways first in our lives. Let's do that for our sake, for the sake of our families, for the sake of all families, and for the sake of the most important family in God's eyes, the family of all humanity. Amen. A summer's evening, I heard a song so fair. It floated through the stillness and came I know not where. It seemed as though the singer was singing just to me the grand and wondrous melody. Of immortality. Glory to God in the highest. Swear upon the grand refrain. Praise Him who brings new salvation. song fell on my listening ear. The great majestic harmonies filled forth in tones so clear. Again I wondered at the strain that haunted every dream and long the singer's face to see me on starry green. Glory to God in the highest. Swear upon the great refrain. Praise him who brings you salvation. Hail
I'd like to thank you for once again taking the time to be with us this morning. I would also like to thank Dr. Herman Weiss and Rebecca Shrimpton and Paul Knox and Richard Smith and Cindy Boyer for helping me to bring this time to you. And for those of you who are part of the First Parish community, I hope that you will stay for some time of, of virtual friendship immediately after the conclusion of this worship celebration, this time of remembering recognizing, embracing God's presence and power and goodness and challenge and call for our lives. And in that light, let us now leave this sacred space and go out into the world ready to swear like crazy. Swear as in take an oath, make a promise. Promise to put God and God's ways first in our lives for the sake of our family so that we can do right by our families, the most right, the most good, and so that through our families and with our families, however they are constituted, we can then go out into the world and do the most good for all of God's family. For that possibility, we say thanks be to God. Amen.